Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brad Harvison, Managing Editor and Internet Editor of PCT Magazine. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Frequently Asked Questions About Mosquito Control, sponsored by Syngenta. And today's webinar is a follow-up to the spring webinar, an IPM approach to mosquito control that PCT and our sister publication, Lawn and Landscape, hosted. And in that webinar, Dr. Grayson Brown and Dr. Nikki Gallagher provided an overview of Zika and other mosquito-borne diseases and shared their insights on how to best manage mosquito populations on your customers' properties. We had a great response to that webinar and wanted to bring back Dr. Brown and Dr. Gallagher to provide helpful application tips and give a mosquito market update. Before we begin, just a couple notes to pass along. Again, we want to thank Syngenta for their sponsorship of this webinar and helping make it possible. And we look forward to everyone's participation. This is an interactive webinar, so we encourage all of, our, all of you to ask questions throughout. And you can do so by uh, typing them into the question box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, I will compile the questions as they come in, and then at the end of the webinar, I will ask them. Uh, when you ask the question, please address them to either Nikki or Grayson so that we know which person to ask it to. Uh, or if you want to ask it to both of them, just write both. Um, so again, this is a two-part webinar. And we'll first hear from Dr. Grayson Brown, followed by Dr. Nikki Gallagher. Uh, Dr. Brown, who is a professor of entomology and director of public health entomology laboratory of the University of Kentucky's Department of uh, Entomology, he'll speak first. Uh, Dr. Brown's work focuses on improving management of arthropod vector diseases such as ticks and flies and mosquitoes. And his group works closely with the public health agency at the federal, state, and local levels primarily on mosquito management. His group was a pioneer in development of several mosquito management techniques and products, and the group is especially well known for their continuing research on backyard mosquito control. Dr. Brown also works extensively with current international products in several South American countries, including locations in Africa, and he's published more than 100 scientific papers, acquired more than $5 million in research grants, is the former president of the Entomological Society of America, which is the largest entomological society in the world. And with that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Grayson Brown. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all again. Uh, the uh, last uh, uh, webinar that we did was uh, so well attended that we got more questions than we could really respond to. So a uh, large part of the uh, seminar, the webinar that we're giving today is really responding to uh, the, uh, the, the questions as uh, we have grouped them. Uh, the uh, questions that we got uh, can be broken out in these broad categories, uh, treatment and efficacy, commercial settings, Zika virus questions, mosquito biology, and then just other. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, address some of the more common recurrent questions that came up in these categories, and then Nikki is going to pick up uh, on, uh, on some of these as well and, uh, and expand on some of, the, some of the things that I'm going to talk about. So uh, with treatment and eff efficacy, one of the most common questions uh, dealt with uh, larvicides and, uh, and specifically how do they work, what are the different kinds, um, and then uh, associated questions like that. So I thought I'd uh, illustrate the uh, effectiveness of larvicides, how they operate, uh, through the mosquito life cycle. Uh, here, here's the, uh, the life cycle, eggs, four larval instars, a pupil stage, and an adult. The uh, principal larvicides are in the box there on the left, and you can see their categories in traditional insecticides, the insect growth regulators, smothering agents, and uh, bacterial pathogens. We go down through this list here, starting with the uh, traditional insecticides. These larvicides are nerve toxins, and they work directly on the uh, individual larva stages. They, they kill each one of them uh, by interrupting uh, nerve uh, transmissions, just, just your traditional uh, insecticide. The IGRs, uh, Altacid, is a methoprene-based uh, product. It interrupts, with, uh, it interrupts the larval molting process, and so it blocks the transition from one larval stage to the subsequent life stage. Because larvae, larvae fail to survive that transition, they don't molt correctly, and, uh, and they die during the molting process. Archer is uh, one of the newer uh, 
uh, pyroproxifen based uh, larvicides, and it acts primarily on the pupae. It's a pupil uh, IGR, but it also uh, greatly reduces the fecundity of, uh, of females that have uh, tarsal contact with a surface that's treated with pyroproxifen, so a long residual product. And then the eggs that come out of those, these females have a much lower hatching rate. So if we look at uh, the IGRs uh, as a group, both Altacid and, and Archer, uh, Altacid here in the blue, Archer in the red, it shows a uh, pretty complete coverage of the uh, mosquito life cycle with those, those two products. It's a unique combination that you don't see in uh, just about any other uh, uh, insecticide group targeting for mosquitoes. Smothering agents are very common. They, they block the ability of the larva to acquire atmospheric air, and they, and they drown. They literally drown in the water. Uh, they, they can be uh, uh, monomolecular films like Agnique or uh, the more traditional uh, oil, cocoa, cocoa oil-based products like Cocoa Bear uh, that is uh, marketed by Clark. Great products to use if the uh, water is going to be very, very still and you get a lot of it to treat. Uh, like a uh, great product to use, for example, in uh, abandoned swimming pools. Bacterial pathogen would be the dunks or the granular form formulation of dunks. That's the mosquito bits. You can buy these things anywhere, Walmarts, Home Depots, whatever. They, uh, it, it uses a, a toxic crystal inside the uh, inside the bacterium that acts as a stomach poison for the, the larva and it, and it just kills the larvae directly by uh, perforating the, uh, the, uh, the hema seal around the, around the stomach lining. So that's the uh, story on, on larvicides. Now another question that we have is, is, it, is it useful to use an IGR with an adult aside when treating for mosquitoes? Uh, if mosquitoes are breeding at another location, I don't see the purpose. Well, I just explained how pyroproxifen affects not just the immature stage of the pupa, but also uh, how it uh, affects the, uh, the adult fecundity and the ability of the larva of the adult to contaminate uh, the larval breeding water. Here's some graphs of a paper that was published in 2005 in the Journal of uh, Medical Entomology. There's been a lot of papers published like this, but this one shows here the ability of the adults to transfer pyroproxifen to larval water. And here we have uh, adults that have spent 120 minutes on a surface treated with uh, pyroproxifen. And then later, when they went to lay their eggs, the eggs uh, successfully uh, developed, the larvae success successfully developed only about 10% of the time. So about a 90% reduction in the larvae that, um, that uh, could, could develop in the water that was contaminated just by coming in contact with a female when she landed on the water to lay her eggs. Um, similarly, the adults exposed to pyroproxen laid fewer viable eggs. Same thing, um, females who were exposed to a treated surface with pyroproxen uh, laid eggs that only hatched about 15% of the time. So about 85% of the eggs don't hatch and about uh, uh, Ninety percent of those that do, larvae die. So, mix the pyroproxifen in with a uh, residual barrier spray makes a lot of sense, specifically, especially for getting uh, uh, mosquitoes that are going to uh, have an impact in future future generations. Say a, a couple of weeks later, this stuff uh, stays stay around for a long time too. So, it's a great way for, of uh, extending a barrier treatment's uh, residual efficacy. Best time of day to treat for mosquitoes. Well, there's not any particular time. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that's really important, probably, as far as uh, barrier sprays are concerned, is when is the uh, period of greatest activity. And this is primarily for protection of the uh, technicians. The, uh, as you can see this Alba pectus, the Asian tiger mosquito. It's uh, most active around 10 in the morning, and then again around uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So it will be less comfortable uh, out there. But as, actually, as a as a, as a matter of uh, experience, we haven't found that if, if you're using good PPE, that, uh, that the, the period of effectiveness, uh, the period of activity for the mosquito makes any difference at all. This is one of the differences between the ULV sprays that uh, 
uh, municipalities use and the residual uh, perimeter sprays that uh, a lot of you all put, you, you guys use. It just doesn't matter what time of day uh, you put this out. For you all these sprays, the uh, time of day is critical, but for uh, residual berry sprays, it's not. Uh, control in commercial settings. This is a great topic. Um, commercial settings is, in, in my opinion, an area that could probably uh, be done. We could do more work with that. We're, we're starting to work in this area now. Uh, there's some very important aspects of working in commercial settings. Uh, first of all, the uh, technique is pretty much the same. Really, you're treating a perimeter, um, but the areas that are treated are often very large, and uh, you can't uh, do it to treat it efficiently with backpack sprayers. It just takes up too much time. Uh, it's just pretty common for uh, one area to take 30 to 50 gallons of spray, and that's going to be 10 to 20 um, backpack loads. Just just takes up too much time. Second, these uh, settings tend to be either continuing accounts or single events. Let's talk about the continuing accounts. Uh, more, this is more like the homeowner uh, application where you come back on a, a more or less fixed uh, schedule. Um, they're somewhat more sensitive to pesticide applications than typical homeowner, but other than that, it's pretty similar. Uh, the applications during non-business hours are probably one of the most common things to uh, uh, Business isn't going to want people to come around with the backpack mist blower. Those mist blowers, you know, they, they, that mist blows all over the place. And, and generally speaking, the, well, most businesses aren't going to want you to be anywhere near them with that, with that, with that machine while, um, while uh, businesses operate. So you have to be prepared to, to come in at off hours. Uh, these uh, types of operations are often more comprehensive to uh, uh, big management, you know, full-sized uh, management program. So this is a great opportunity for uh, using uh, the types of uh, uh, integrated vector management programs that are being offered, not by, just by Syngenta, but by, by other companies as well. Great, great, great place to try these things out. Uh, events, uh, one-off occurrences, things like weddings, sports events, uh, could be a patient's home. This is something, I'm going to mention this here in a few minutes, but uh, for Zika, we are uh, advocating that public health agencies consider uh, using perimeter sprays around my remaining patients' homes as a way of chemically isolating that house. And so we have been promoting this to public health agencies uh, throughout the U.S., and, uh, and some of them are, are interested in doing that. Uh, I know Virginia in particular and Kentucky as, as well, and uh, we're still talking with West Virginia about it. But, but uh, there's going to be opportunities for our folks, at least in those, uh, those states, to, to get into that. Generally doesn't require very long residual life, uh, so you can use uh, products that don't necessarily have long, long residual lives. Some, exa some examples, uh, office buildings, small office buildings, which look uh, to, to the mosquito just like a house. Uh, golf courses, uh, groundskeepers of golf courses are doing more and more of their mosquito control. But that's still a uh, lucrative area, particularly if you're uh, running a landscape business that already has a golf course account. There's great perimeter, always great perimeter around these uh, fairways for treating. Uh, school yards, church yards also uh, very commonly have great barriers, and you have a lot of people standing around uh, sweaty in, in these environments, and the, we know the odor of sweat, bacterial action on sweat, is a great attractor for mosquitoes that packs them from a long ways away. So this is a great place to, uh, to put a barrier treatment up. Cemeteries, we love working in cemeteries for a variety of reasons. Won't go into them here. But uh, they're very, very popular places, particularly as you can see here on Mother's Day, Memorial Day, and Father's Day. Uh, they, all, they always, well, a lot of them anyway, have uh, the same type of vegetation that you would have around a home. So it's really very similar to treating homes. Just really big. Uh, and green spaces, neighborhood green spaces, parks, some of them owned by a municipality, some owned by a neighborhood association. Every one of them has different uh, management uh, criteria and guidelines and neighborhood associations in particular tend to have at least some people that are insecticide averse, so you have to deal with that. But, uh, but these are great places to, to, to get involved. Uh, as I mentioned, you generally need larger pieces of equipment. This is the uh, truck-mounted mist blower that, that we use. It's an electric-powered 
uh, it's gas powered uh, uh, blower and electric powered uh, insecticide pump. But with this unit, we can treat miles of uh, perimeter in, in a day very, very easily. So it's a, it's a great tool uh, that we, we like a lot. And it weighs about 100 pounds, so it's pretty easy to take in and put in and take out of the truck. So, can we discuss the differences between 80s and Culex control? Well, they're, they're really quite a bit different. Uh, 80s and Culex uh, are almost uh, diametrically opposed to each other. They, they don't transmit much of the same diseases. They, they have different host range. Uh, they have different activity periods. They are prefer cleaner water. Uh, 80s prefers cleaner water. Culex prefers uh, stagnant water. So in years that, uh, uh, where you have a lot of rain, you're going to have more of an 80s problem. In years where you don't have much rain, it's more drought conditions, you're going to have a lot of stagnant water, particularly in underground crypts like uh, catch basins, you're going to have more Culex. One of the big issue differences is daytime resting sites. 80s tend to uh, have their resting sites near the ground where you can treat it with a perimeter spray. Uh, Culex has their resting sites way up high in the trees, so they're best treated with uh, uh, ULV equipment. These are the different types of control approaches and how they might uh, be effective against the ADs. And you can see they're really quite different. Um, as I just mentioned, back air perimeter vegetation just hammers the ADs and has, has absolutely no significant effect on QLEX, uh, whereas the uh, ULV sprayers are certainly more effective on QLEX than, than they are on the ADs. Just mentioned the difference between the wet summers and the dry summers. Even personal protection, the use of, of uh, repellents are more effective against ADs than they are against Culex. The reason they're, they're, they're less effective against Culex is because Culex come out very late at night, like midnight to two in the morning when people are sleeping. In fact, these mosquitoes are called house mosquitoes. They're the ones that buzz around your ear late summer night while you're laying in bed. And most people by that time their uh, a repellent they might have had on during the day is worn off, or maybe they've showered or whatever, but they're not wearing much mosquito repellent when they're laying there in bed, and certainly we don't have a lot of other personal protections as well. So uh, you're, you're generally more, more exposed to QX when they're, they're, they're active. Uh, Non-target effects. Uh, this is uh, an important question. This question comes up continuously. Uh, what, what is the impact of uh, perimeter sprays on on non-target effects. Frankly, it's a hard thing to study uh, because most of the non-target organisms uh, move around a lot much, a lot more than uh, mosquitoes do. And we, when we try to uh, treat for mosquitoes, we try to treat for the specific daytime resting sites. We're very targeted in the site selection, uh, but the uh, non-target mosquito, uh, non-target insects, are moving all over the place. So what I have here are some just guiding principles for minimizing the impact on non-targets. First of all, number one, never ever treat flower beds. You don't ever find enough mosquitoes on in there to make it worthwhile. It just absolutely hammers the pollinators. Uh, you're going to kill a bunch of the big showy butterflies. They're going to be killed right there. They're going to be laying there in the grass. The homeowners are going to see it. Uh, there's, there's no advantage in treating flower beds and you are going to create big problems, especially with pollinators, and sooner or later, that's going to cause legislative response. So never treat those. Never treat long grass, but mowed grass. Uh, mosquitoes don't hang out there. It's just going to create uh, more problems for the lawn, uh, lawn care of the homeowner. And most importantly, it's going to greatly increase the homeowner exposure to the treatments. As soon as they go out, or their pets go out and run around on the grass, they pick up uh, uh, the insect inside. I don't put larvicides in water bodies that have any established uh, aquatic biota. The mosquitoes that we're targeting, whether it's Aedes or Culex, are all container breeders. These are the mosquitoes that are breeding only in ephemeral uh, pools. They don't, they don't uh, breed in areas that have dragonflies and fish and stuff like that. So if you already have aquatic biota, there's no, there's no reason to put something, anything in that, that water. Because they're not there's not going to be an 80s or QX mosquito in there. Some of the uh, non-target effects are simply unavoidable. You, uh, you can't avoid it. The perimeter sprays are going to be, uh, in, for the daytime resting sites for mosquitoes, going to be the same as the daytime resting sites for uh, lady beetles and fire, 
fireflies. You're going to kill a lot of spiders, especially once you get up spraying around uh, the base of the house. Um, that's just that's just going to happen. Uh, but what what the objective of these principles are is to minimize the impact on those non non targets. Uh, organic and green control options. This is a question we get from homeowners quite a bit. There's a lot of interest in the, uh, by homeowners, particularly in the the type of clientele that's likely to subscribe to a mosquito control service. Uh, generally speaking, uh, they're not as effective as the traditional insecticides. They are have a, have a greatly reduced residual uh, effectiveness. They're more expensive, um, but there's some. There is a group that that that, that would have appeal to this. I know that Terminex has a uh, garlic oil based. Uh, uh, barrier spray that they're marketing. And so it wouldn't hurt to have something like this around. You can pick these things up uh, in, uh, home, in uh, home depots and, and that type of thing. Uh, but, but don't expect to get the same type of control that you get from uh, traditional insecticides. You just, they're, they're just not going to be there. Most of these work through a volatile uh, chemical and as soon as the volatile um, uh, is gone, then their effectiveness is gone. And so as soon as you can't smell that garlic oil anymore, then that garlic oil is not effective. Some, virus, some Zika virus questions. Uh, can the Zika virus uh, be treated or cured in pregnant women or women that plan on getting pregnant? Uh, no, it can't. It's, uh, there, there's, there's, there's some symptomatic treatments, um, but generally speaking, there's not much. Uh, they, the only thing you, they can do for pregnant women is to monitor uh, first of all, the uh, the amniotic fluid for the uh, uh, presence of the virus, then the immunoglobulin to make sure that that's going down correctly, and then begin well, as soon as the ultrasounds begin on the baby, uh, they begin monitoring for uh, head head width. But um, but that's pretty much that takes us into the clinical aspect of uh, Zika. We don't work in that area, but it becomes very much a, a relationship between the mother and, and the doctor. Uh, the mosquito itself picks up the virus as soon as it uh, takes a blood meal, but that virus can only infect a, a small number of mosquito species. And what it does is as soon as it's ingested, the virus moves into the cells lining the uh, stomach wall of the mosquito. They replicate in there, and then from there they invade the blood system of the mosquito, migrate up to the salivary glands, invade, invade those cells, uh, replicate there, and then finally are expressed through the salivary fluid. Each of those steps is a bottleneck, and unless it's a very specific mosquito species, the virus is simply not uh, evolved to handle that step. So, um, so any any mosquito will pick it up, but only uh, certain mosquitoes can actually uh, transmit it. Now, does the mosquito hatch with it? Uh, it depends on the mosquito. Uh, the uh, well, no. The answer of that is no. The, mosquito, the, the, the virus does not pass into the egg stage. Uh, the one way that it can persist for a long time in a mosquito is if it's in a Culex mosquito and a mosquito overwinters Culex mosquitoes, unlike Aedes, overwinter as adults. And so it's possible in temperate zones uh, should it get into the Culex mosquito for it to be passed through the winter uh, in, inside the body of the, of the Culex mosquito. That hasn't been confirmed. But it happens with every other virus in Culex mosquitoes, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't see why it would not happen with Zika. The uh, species that carry it is uh, primarily primarily Aedes aegypti, Aedes aegypti for sure. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, anecdotal evidence now that Aedes albopictus in some areas is uh, a secondary vector of unknown significance, probably a small role at this point. And there's a recent report, it's really just a few days old, that uh, Culex, Culex kinkafasciatus, which is the southern house mosquito, uh, is, um, is transmitting this virus in Puerto Rico and in Brazil. Uh, we don't know yet how serious that is. I'll probably make a few more comments about that. It's pretty big news. It would really change our Zika management plan quite a bit. Uh, mosquito biology questions. Uh, well, I just mentioned I just mentioned this uh, recent evidence that Culex skinkin fasciatus is also a vector. Uh, these are the two that are for sure 
wor that we're sure worried about. They're uh, black, black mosquitoes with uh, white uh, stripes on the legs. Uh, the key thing is that the uh, Aedes aegypti has this lighter shape on the top of its thorax, whereas the Aedes albopictus has just a, a thin, a, a single uh, white stripe. Uh, most people don't live in Aedes aegypti areas, but do live in albopictus, uh, are both considered. Well, here's the uh, current map of the distribution of these two species. But uh, I would like to point out that this is where Aedes aegypti is found. Here in Kentucky, for example, right here, we find about um, one mosquito out of every 6,000 is an Aedes aegypti, far too low to be of significance in uh, virus transmission. So although, yeah, we find them up here, there's not enough of them to transmit the disease. The, in fact, the disease-capable uh, populations are, are, are found basically along here, especially from roughly Houston south and from Orlando south. Those are the areas of, of the highest risk for disease transmission from Aedes aegypti. Avipicus, though, does. It, 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 is, it is in large numbers all the way up well, almost to Canada here. So if a albumictus becomes a serious or significant and important primary vector, then we will, uh, then we'll be, it, it'll be a much bigger deal. Uh, the itch of a mosquito bite. Well, I've got a really bad picture of this. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm almost afraid, ashamed to show it. But basically what happens when a mosquito uh, feeds on a person, it, uh, it has to probe around quite a bit because not very much of the skin below the surface has uh, capillary tubes, only about 5%. And it is probing around. Uh, it generates a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, uh, an immune re response based on histamine, and that's what causes the actual wheel here. It causes it irritates the nerve endings and, and that type of thing. So it's a response to the salivary gland the proteins that are being injected and the general invasion of the uh, of the skin through the uh, through the uh, proboscis or the stylus of the, of the mosquito. So basically, it's a histamine reaction. It can be countered if it's a real problem with uh, antihistamine cream. So that's that's a way to get around that. How far do mosquitoes fly? Well, uh, you can read the uh, description here. Different species uh, fly different uh, amounts. You know, there's some 150 species of mosquitoes and North America. Each one has their own biology, ecology, behavior, and so on. Uh, and they each have different flight characteristics, and flight distances, and ranges, and they orient towards different things. But here's some common uh, rule of thumb numbers for most of the 80s, less than a kilometer. Anopheles, one and a half to two kilometers. And Culex, uh, five to seven kilometers. Now, Culex has uh, the largest flight range of these because uh, they're mostly bird feeders, so they so when they, they they are mostly in the trees, and when they take off from the trees, they're much more likely to get caught up by wind and bone. In reality, none of these things are good flyers; they're all pretty weak, really. Uh, so it's pretty common for for these guys to get caught up way high in the tree, uh, way high up in the, above the trees. These guys start off a foot or so off the ground, so they're much like less likely to be picked up by by big winds. As a result, uh, we we think of the a flight range for these two uh, species being about 200 meters, a little over 200 yards. What causes Zika outbreak? Well, basically Zika started off in Africa yeah, about 50 years ago and slowly moved its way across. And when it hit Brazil, it seemed to have changed. It suddenly started causing higher viremia, suddenly started causing a lot of complications that had never been seen before with this virus. And as that has moved up um, through, the, uh, through uh, the Central America and into the Caribbean, it has continued to change. It continues to uh, evolve and mutate and cause uh, a whole panoply of uh, symptomologies now that uh, had never been seen with this virus. So it's a combination of coming to the Americas and mutating that has uh, caused the outbreak and the concern about this outbreak right now. Different types of traps. These are some of the most common sampling tools for uh, mosquitoes. We have a uh, dipper here. It's a simple cup. You dip into the water, uh, count the number of mosquito larvae, or often just 
uh, make a decision on control on based on presence and absence. This is an egg trap, an over trap for collecting eggs. This is, these are the eggs right here of uh, 80s mosquitoes. Um, most of you all would not use that. This is the, the, the trap that most of the people, most of the public health agencies are going to now. BG Sentinel trap is baited with, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily use CO2, although this one does have a CO2 attachment, but th they're mostly used uh, with a chemical that mimics the smell of uh, human uh, sweat, and as a result, um, it attracts primarily mosquitoes that are looking to feed on humans. So most of the public health agencies love this, doesn't require CO2 necessarily, doesn't require a light, um, and they, it's very easy to set up and, and use. A little expensive, but a uh, great trap. This is an old standby here, the CDC light trap, miniature light trap, with, uh, baited with a number of different possibilities. This particular one is for catching mosquitoes live. Uh, there are others that, uh, that attract, um, um, keep catch mosquitoes and kill them. Both of these traps here attract mosquitoes that are looking for a blood meal. This trap here is called a gravity trap. It attracts mosquitoes that have had a blood meal and are looking for a place to lay their eggs. And so they're attracted by the smell of, of water. In this case, we have uh, water that's been infused with uh, probably rabbit chow or cat, cat chow. Uh, and it's going to be attractive to Culex mosquitoes. And so this is a great way of sampling those mosquitoes up there in the trees that uh, that you can't otherwise get. So, uh, but if you use different types of water, you can attract different types of mosquitoes. So that's the one thing about the gravity trap, is it's going to catch whatever mosquitoes are attracted by that particular by the water in that particular trap. Uh, question about uh, repellents, uh, particularly uh, questions about the Consumer Reports uh, article that appeared in April. Here is a screen, screen grab from that uh, uh, article showing the different uh, types of, uh, this is just a, the, the top six or so of the uh, uh, repellents that were in that list. Uh, and you can see that basically DEET and picaridin are about the same, really. I'm not sure that there's any difference in this 96 rating versus the 93 rating. Uh, the, the one that's, that's not DEET or picaridin is uh, oil of Lemon eucalyptus, it's a, it's a great product, but it does stain, stain clothing. Uh, so what I tell people is that uh, if, if you can use DEET, because it's cheaper and just as effective as anything else, it's gold standard, uh, if you can use DEET, then use it. If uh, it causes a problem for you, if you get skin irritation, skin sensitivity, then use Picaridin. Oops. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of uh, few more few more comments here. Uh, new developments since we gave our webinar in March. Uh, first female to male sexual transmission has occurred. It's only happened once, only once. So, but that that is a, a development. Some mysterious transmission to a caregiver in Utah. It's not sexual transmission, not travel related, not mosquito involved. Some other transmission route that is as yet unknown. Uh, we now have probable local transmission going on in south, southern Florida. Uh, Culex fasciatus, as, as I mentioned, now is now implicated as a secondary vector, again, of unknown significance. Uh, it will really be a game changer if it uh, turns out that it's uh, an important vector. Zika microcephaly, this is the thing that most people are concerned about with, with Zika. We know a lot more about microcephaly now, uh, and that is that certainly women who who have had Zika, recovered from it, months later became pregnant, they don't have a problem. So that's good. Uh, we do know that uh, the women that are, are infected in the first trimester are the ones most likely to have microcephalic babies. There's another set, a whole bunch of uh, uh, pathologies that are showing up with uh, babies born of uh, Zika-infected mothers. One is the acquired microcephaly. The baby starts off normal, but as it develops, his head fails to, to grow at the normal rate. A whole bunch of other neurological uh, uh, problems, though, are sure to show up in some of these babies. That's going to play out for years. Um, most states now have an active Zika response system in place. If you want to work with uh, a state 
Uh, you should call the uh, State Department of Public Health and ask about their Zika response program and uh, what they're doing in terms of residual or barrier treatments. Uh, as I mentioned, we're promoting barrier treatments as a way of chemically isolating a virulent patient and their neighbors from the mosquito population. I think this would be a, a great tool, one that we will probably be using uh, more of here in the, if not this year, certainly next year. Because it's starting to look like Zika is not really going to be that big of a public health threat uh, in the U.S. this year. However, one experience that we have from, uh, from, uh, from Brazil is that it took about a year before it really took off. And uh, so that's the thing that we're really worried about. Not so much uh, about 2016 now. We're pretty deep into the mosquito season. But uh, what's going to happen in 2017, I'm, I'm probably more concerned about that than I am of 2016 at this point. So that's uh, my presentation, and I'll uh, be looking for, uh, forward to answer some of your questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And uh, we'll, we'll move into our next uh, presentation in here. And uh, while we get our next presenter, Nikki Gallagher, set up just a, a couple quick notes to, to pass along. Again, um, we did receive some great questions during the first uh, presentation, and we, again, continue to encourage you to ask those throughout Nikki's presentation. And you can do so by entering them into the question box in the right-hand corner of your screen. I will compile them, and we'll ask them at the end. And then, again, it is a good idea if you want to address to whom the question you wanted to go to, either Nikki or Dr. Brown. And um, Okay, so again, our next speaker is Dr. Nikki Gallagher, and Nikki serves as the Technical Services Manager for Syngenta Professional Pest Management in the Midwest and the Northeast. And uh, Dr. Gallagher has a strong background in urban entomology with more than 10 years of experience, and she maintains responsibility for all steel testing and technical support within a region and coordinates numerous research programs with university researchers. And through her work at Syngenta, she continues her passion to protect people's health, properties, and the environment. And Nikki holds a bachelor's degree from Mount St. Joseph University, as well as a master's and doctoral degrees from Ohio State University. And with that, we'll turn things over to Nikki. Thank you so much, Brad. And I wanted to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. It's a pleasure to talk about mosquitoes again. Um, so we'll uh, just uh, jump straight into this. And I have a couple of slides that Gary Kell from Specialty Consultants was uh, kind enough to share with us on uh, the mosquito market update. So if we look at the number of companies that are actually offering a mosquito control service uh, from the past couple of years, um, you can see you know, throughout the region, um, we've had some quite some significant growth, and, and in particular, for 2015, um, you know, in, in some cases, um, this is more than a 10% growth uh, in the number of companies offering this service. So nationally, um, about 34% of companies uh, who participated uh, in, in this uh, survey do offer a mosquito control service. Um, the highest regions, uh, which shouldn't be a surprise, was in the southeast and south central region, um, you know, which would be due just to the high level of mosquito pressure that they have. And the fewest would be out west, uh, where you know, large portions of, of uh, the western portion of the country just has uh, fewer mosquito pressure anyway. Um, the amount that a company will charge for the mosquito service is fairly similar throughout most portions of the country. Uh, on average, it's about $200 for a service. Um, the highest was actually uh, out west at $251, and the lowest was at $130 in the southeast. Um, my guess is the southeast had the lowest price because there's probably a lot more competition with each other uh, offering these services, so they have to be very price competitive. Um, but just on, on average, nationwide, we're looking at about uh, $200 in 2015 uh, for a mosquito service. Um, the annual revenue derived from mosquito control is nothing, you know, to, to turn your nose up to. Um, you know, looking at this nationwide, um, you know, we have seen some growth. In 2015, um, the annual revenue was about 6.5%. Um, 
you know, and there was some variation as we look at certain territories. You know, again, out west, it was only a very small portion at about 2%. Um, and in the southeast, um, we had the biggest growth going from about 5.6% um, in 2014 to almost 9% in 2015. So obviously, you know, customers are more aware and companies are, are probably putting more information out there. And you know, they're probably uh, increasing this growth with established customers and then expanding that on to new customers. And if we look at the actual dollars, so the actual revenue that was brought in in 2015, so this was from a total of 270 companies that participated in the survey. Mosquitoes brought in $140 million. Now, it's not as much as, as bed bugs or nuisance ants, but that's certainly a significant amount of money and a large percentage, uh, a large uh, opportunity, sorry, to, to grow your company. So a lot of opportunity there. And that was just for 2015. Um, it'll be quite interesting to see what the numbers look like for this year. But there are obviously challenges as you go into these services, you know, just being aware of the, the license, licenses needed for each state. You know, customer concerns uh, have to be addressed. You know, uh, Dr. Brown pointed, uh, touched on some of these, you know, safety around pollinators and the environment. You know, customers simply can't be passive with this type of uh, program. They have to be involved. Um, you have to be committed to training your technicians for mosquito control. Um, you know, you have to have very thorough uh, inspection techniques, thorough graphs, um, you know, a thorough and precise protocol. You know, keep up to date on label changes, you know, especially around any potential pollinator language or uh, weather awareness. And equipment is also really important. You know, Understanding the equipment that you're using, um, any droplet size uh, requirements, uh, as well as calibration. Uh, the next series of slides I'd like to get into are just addressing some of the questions, again, around mosquito biology and uh, equipment. So just as a refresher, you know, for the most part, when we're treating backyards, we're targeting mosquitoes that belong in the genus Aedes. Uh, you know, whether this is Aedes albatictus or Aedes aegypti, they're, they're two very common backyard mosquitoes. So we're, we're treating typically 10 feet and below. Uh, we're not targeting Culex, which tends to rest higher up in the trees. Using backpack misters are re really ideal for this because, you know, droplet size and pressure and technique are really important for a thorough dispersion of the product to these target sites. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, and, and this was uh, an area where we got a lot of questions. So uh, I, I'm going to skip over this because Dr. Brown did cover this when the best time of day to treat is for mosquitoes. Um, the only thing I might add on to, onto this is to just be aware of when pollinators are in the garden and you know, to um, you know, try to schedule it so you're, you're not treating when they're out and about. That's just good product stewardship. Um, one question, is there a difference between misting with a backpack blower system versus other types of equipment like a tree and shrub gun? Um, another one was, you know, what are the settings required on backpack misters? Um, and, and there are no required settings listed on the Demand CS label or the Archer label. Um, you know, always read the label um, to make sure that there are any requirements, but there are no specific requirements on the Demand and CS. Uh, the Mans CS and Archer label. But I did want to share these images with you. So we used a steel SR200 backpack mister and treated vegetation. And the way we measured coverage was using a water-sensitive card. So uh, on your far left is a water-sensitive card that's dry. So it remains yellow. When it comes into contact with water, it's going to be stained blue. So we placed these water sensitive cards on a vertical wall. So this wasn't even in vegetation at this point. And we did one swipe at various settings on the steel 
with the nozzle angle at zero degrees. So basically, we've got our applicator at elbow height with a moderate walking speed of about 32 feet per minute. So you can see as we go from meter setting one all the way out to five, we get a more thorough coverage. So at one, you can see we have a lot more yellow in there. There's a lot more space, and we, we don't have as much coverage. Once we get into setting three and higher, we're getting almost 100% coverage. But again, this is with no obstacles in the way. So what happens, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, what, another important question is what happens when you are actually putting these water-sensitive cards into foliage? And, and that's going to be some of these next pictures. Um, quickly just wanted to show you what it looks like when you use a hand-pumped sprayer. So the droplets are much larger than a mister. And we had to actually increase our spray volume. So with one application, again, large droplets, little coverage. With a second application, it gets a little better. But it took three applications to get thorough coverage on that card. And, and what concerns me with this is, would you be actually treating the underside of a leaf with just a hand pump sprayer? And I don't think you would. Now, I don't think many people would, would promote or recommend using a hand sprayer for a mosquito application. Um, but I just wanted to show you the opposite side of the spectrum and what that looks like. OK, so here's treating actual foliage. So this is, of course, Scythia bush, moderate density. Um, this is the top side of the leaf at the setting one on the SR200 by steel. Uh, you can see some droplets on the leaf, but um, it's not thoroughly covered. Um, and, and this is me going in using a circular up and down motion, um, really trying to get thorough coverage. When I bump it up to setting three, you can see that the leaves are really wet. And we've got nice coverage. If we take a look at the water-sensitive cards that were dispersed throughout that bush, you can see we get much better coverage at that setting three. Um, this card on the far left, on the bottom, was the card that was closest to me. So it got a little heavier application. We see some more drips. But for the most, most part, all three cards had fairly even coverage which is really what we're going for. So regardless of what backpack mister you might be using, be comfortable with the settings that you're using. Just make sure you're getting thorough application. My concern with a low setting, such as, as we have up top here with the setting number one, is you know, you're going to get some coverage. You're probably going to get some control of mosquitoes. But how long is that going to last? You know, you're probably going to get a callback much, much sooner. And of course, did it get to the underside of the leaf? And you know, I did try to get to the end of the side of the leaf using a circular motion. But on setting one, for the most part, that leaf was dry. Um, at setting three, you know, we've got a higher flow rate. And we've also uh, got more airflow. So it's really pushing those leaves up. And for the most part, those leaves were wet. Um, for this demonstration, I did just use water, so that's why I'm not wearing gloves in the picture. So there was no uh, pesticide included in this application. So again, just practice with your settings to make sure you're doing a thorough application. Um, there is no droplet size requirement with uh, backpack sprays uh, when it comes to the Demand CS or Archer label. You know, typically, these misters are, are putting out droplets around the 150 micron range or larger which is really great for treating foliage. It gives you less drift issues, um, so you're not going to run into um, any, any issues in, in treating areas that you shouldn't be. <laughs> when we've done our applications, we have not used the pressure pump, and that was a question. Um, so if you are using the pressure pump, I, I would just recommend um, you know, just paying attention to the settings that you're using. I would assume you would probably be OK using a lower setting if you're going to use the pressure pump. But I personally have no experience in trying out that pressure pump that you can purchase for steel models. Um, just wanted to point out, uh, again, the importance of a uniform mixture before doing your applications. Um, highly, highly recommend uh, using a service container that you do all of your mixing beforehand inside of the container. And uh, so, if you, for example, if you were to use Demand CS and Archer, 
we can supply these service containers and labels. Uh, so you're 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 following the the state laws that will uh, these sticker labels can be put on the service container, and you can have these all ready to go, and then put it in your tank so you have thorough and even coverage at your customer's site. Um, if you if you mix in the tank, you can run into the problem that the product will sink to the bottom and run through the solution feed tube, and you'll have a much higher uh, concentration at one part of the yard, and the last section of the yard that you treat could be mostly just water. OK, uh, just a couple more questions. <clears throat> um, somebody had, had asked, you know, during the inspection period, um, you know, is it important to move away things like toys? And, and yes, you know, that's, that's very important. So as you're doing your inspection, you know, if you see things like toys, dog bowls, um, those should be stored away prior to doing the treatment. Um, some other things that are important as you're walking around uh, doing your inspection is, you know, even take note of the surrounding neighborhood before you get to the house. Um, if it's a site that's near a wood, uh, a wooded area or a pasture or a marsh, that could be a source of issues uh, that might be out of your hands, but good to know about uh, what challenges you might be facing uh, if it's a source of mosquitoes. <coughs> Sorry. And of course, um, after you do your application, you want to restrict access to that area until the treatment has dried. Um, we typically recommend a two-hour window is, is really good uh, to ensure that you've had uh, the, the area is completely dry before um, your know, pets or children go back into the area. Uh, just a review of our program. Uh, you know, some people ha had asked about that. So this is the Secure Choice Mosquito Assurance Program. So this is one application uh, about every 60 days. And if you follow our protocol, um, you are part of the assurance program. So if you have to go back and do a retreatment within that 60-day period, uh, Syngenta will uh, supply you with the products that you had to use for that retreatment. So it, it involves using the combination of our Lambda Sly Halothrin pyrethroid, which is demand CS, at the high rate, so 0.8 ounces per gallon, along with our insect growth regulator, Archer, which contains pyroproxacin, and you would use that at one ounce per gallon. And you can actually purchase this through a multi-pack, and it gets you 80 finished gallons uh, for uh, this uh, mosquito program. Of course, you can also use these products for other insects and sites that are listed on the label. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So Demand CS is a great fit for this. Um, you're you're going to get that 60-day residual because of the unique microcap. Um, so it's a microcap lambda fly halothrin. So it's going to hold up to uh, environmental pressures such as sun and a high pH. And I know that there are other lambda fly halothrin products out there, um, but to get that 60-day length of residual activity from mosquitoes. Um, you need to use a microcap that's going to hold up. So demand microcap is in the, the top left. But when you put microcaps um, under various pressures, you know, uh, such as you know, high pressure and heat, you want it to remain intact and be available uh, for, for the insect. You, know, you don't want it to degrade um, too quickly and, and not be available. And we've seen that with some other microcaps. Um, you know, our microcap is, is very unique and, and it cannot be replicated. So that's why we're, we can give you that 60-day length of activity. <clears throat> so even though it's microcaps, you still do get good knockdown. Uh, our microcaps come out in a variety of sizes, so from small to large. Um, this is the same data that I shared with you in the first webinar, but this is broken down for knockdown versus mortality on the different plants that we tested. So, so basically, knockdown, which is the table on the left-hand side, at the high rates, which is what we recommend for this program, we still got you know a little bit above 75% knockdown at one hour. And then 
and that's for the uh, entire uh, eight-week period. So an average uh, of 75%, at least 75% mortality over that eight-week period. And again, for mortality, it's greater than 90% mortality at that high rate for the average of eight weeks. So <laughs> I'm actually going to cut myself off here. Um, there were tons of questions, and, and I think we're going to make these slides available for you so you will have the answers. Um, but I just want to take the last couple of minutes in case we do have some questions from the audience. Um, so Brad, uh, can we use these last couple of minutes for, for some questions? Hi, Nikki. Yeah, and we did uh, we did get some questions for, for both you and uh, Dr. Brown here. And we'll continue to field them as they come in. So again, if you want to ask them, um, go ahead and, and enter them into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. Right-hand side of your screen. Uh, first question we had was uh, was for Grayson, and that is, uh, is it safe for professional gardeners after Mosquito Company has been there? Yes, it is. Uh, there's. You just need to wait until the uh, spray is dried. That's all. Okay. Um, Nikki, this question I, I think maybe was for you as, as you had talked about backpack sprayers. How heavy are the back are the backpack sprayers? In other words, um, can a technician do this work for eight hours? <laughs> That's a really good question, Brad. And I don't have the weight for each model off the top of my head. Um, you know, there's a couple of different models, even just with steel. So I kind of gravitate to the uh, the steel SR200 because it is a lighter model. I think it's about 30 to 40 pounds, which for me is is doable. Um, you know, it only holds about two gallons of water, so that's what makes it lighter. Um, you know, I, I know there, there are other models that are out there that are heavier. And there are people who, who do this all the time for, you know, an eight-hour day. So it can be done, but I think it's a personal choice to, for you or the technician and what they're capable of. I would uh, add to that that uh, we have treated as many as 15 residential properties in one day uh, with one technician. Uh, Grayson, this next question is for you. Um, in, the, in your presentation, you had touched a little bit about natural products. Um, another one came in, though, similarly. They were asking about products such as lemongrass and citronella sprays. Can you speak to that? Now, all of these things in the, uh, in the essential oil category, uh, lemongrass is, is, is another very common one. Probably not quite as effective insecticidally as uh, garlic oil, but it's the same idea, it's based on a volatile, and uh, as soon as the smell is gone, then its effectiveness is gone. So um, it's a natural product, it's um, effective for a short time, and it's pretty expensive. And uh, Grayson, you had mentioned uh, briefly sort of the, the, the mystery transmission disease case that's going on in Utah. Um, can you give us your thoughts on that, what you think, you know, hypothesis, might, what might be going on there? Uh, elderly patient uh, be, was viremic, it was travel related. Uh, he succumbed to, uh, to Zika, which is pretty unusual. I think that's only the second um, fatality due to Zika that I'm aware of. Uh, family members, caregiver, uh, she became infected. It's not sexually related. My guess is possibly uh, some uh, contamination, blood. Uh, she was handling, bathing him. Uh, you know, one of the things about Zika is that it can express not just in blood, but also in, in semen and uh, saliva and urine. Uh, certainly this caregiver would have been handling, uh, I don't know, maybe a colostomy bag or uh, so, so some other bag with uh, bodily fluids in it. And my, that's, that's my guess what it is. But we'll know more in another week or two. Uh, one question that came in, and I'll actually answer this one. Someone was asking if they had missed a part of the presentation, or they want to see the see some of the slides again, or they want to just uh, hear it again. Um, will it be available? Yes, we'll have that archived up on the on the PCT website, and uh, we'll also make a copy available to Syngenta as well, so you can look at it uh, from the Syngenta website as well. So I, I did want to uh, make you aware of that. Um, um, Nikki, I think this, this question would, would be for you, and that is, um, does, does Syngenta offer any marketing materials 
um, as far as marketing your mosquito control services to your various clients? Brad, yes, they do. So if you purchase Demand CS and Archer and you're um, using the Secure Choice program, uh, touch base with your local sales rep. So if you go to our Syngenta PMP website, you'll be able to locate who your local area sales rep is, um, or, or I'm sure even your local distribution rep can uh, put you in the right direction. And you can uh, email with them, give them a call, and they can tell you about all the different uh, marketing things that we have to offer. Okay, a uh, question was, uh, I, I think I'll maybe I'll open uh, the next, uh, maybe uh, make this one, uh, throw it out to both of you. And that is, uh, maintenance tips, what kind of maintenance tips can you, can you provide for making the backpack sprayers work most efficiently and also the, kind of the proper care so that you get the longevity out of the sprayers? Well, my, our experience has been it's a, it's a two-cycle motor. We, we use the SR420, uh, which is a little bit older model than what uh, Nikki was working with. But uh, ours is a two-cycle two, uh, motor, so it's really important, really important to uh, drain the gas out and you know, put it up for the winter correctly. Uh, other than that, uh, the, the one uh, repair issue that we've had is that if you just throw it in the back of the truck, it, you tend to break the little knobs off, and, and it's pretty hard to find just the right knob uh, for the, uh, uh, the nozzle control. Uh, one other maintenance tip that I think is probably important is you really ought to plan on replacing the, uh, the feeder lines. There's a clear plastic line that runs from the tank to the tip of the uh, nozzle. Uh, you ought to replace those whenever they show any yellowing. because they, They'll get brittle and, and uh, perhaps more importantly, they'll get some mold or mildew growing on the inside. So. Those are some things that I would uh, certainly keep in mind. It wouldn't be a bad thing. I mean, these are not high-performance motors. It wouldn't be a bad idea, especially late in the season, to put a little bit of uh, gas stabilizer in the fuel um, just, just, just in case you don't use it all up and it sits for a while. Yeah, Brad, I think those are, are all uh, excellent, excellent points. And, uh, we will be having a series of videos coming onto our Syngenta PMP website, and one of them will include maintenance of the backpack mister, and um, you're doing the application as well as how to properly clean uh, the backpack mister. One uh, one issue I'd like to one point I'd like to make, and that is that uh, if you go with uh, Archer in these tanks, these tanks are uh, polypropylene. And uh, there is some concern by, by people that have worked with it in the past that it will stay around, for, it, that it attaches to the tank and, and has, to, has to be rinsed out extra uh, in order to get uh, good thorough rinsing. Do you, do you buy that, uh, Nikki? Seems like we talked about this before, but I don't remember what your recommendation was. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could designate certain tanks to be used just for mosquitoes, and then that would not be a problem if you were concerned about getting Archer into areas that uh, you know you could be using the mister for elsewhere. Um, but yeah, typically you know thorough rinsing with uh, soap and water is always good. But I know like paraproxen does have a tendency to uh, adhere to uh, plastic. Um, so if there is concern there, you know this, this could be with you know just any pyroproxen formulation. Um, Again, you know, you could always designate those tanks strictly just for mosquito application. Okay. Um, well, uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Geller, those are all the questions we had. Uh, some great questions. So I want to thank our uh, all of our participants for sending in those questions. And uh, again, we want to thank Syngenta for sponsoring the the webinar. Before we end things, I want to just turn things over back over to 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 Nikki and Grayson. If uh, you have any final words you want to pass along before we uh, finish off the webinar today. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, like Nikki said, this is a growing area. Uh, it's growing not only in uh, in acceptance, especially this year. Uh, I know that a lot of you have already done just a crazy number of uh, mosquito controls uh, this year compared to previous years. But I, I want you to to, to know that uh, things aren't going to end with Zika. There's more on deck. There's more coming. And so the concern about uh, Zika, the public concern, the, uh, 
demand for uh, backyard mosquito control is probably going to be growing going into the future. Uh, Brad, you know, I would just add that you know, we have an important role um, to be good stewards of our industry as well as the environment. Um, when we're going out and doing this, we're primarily doing this from a nuisance mosquito um, platform. You know, you know, some folks might have uh, contracts to work with local health departments, and, and we'll be going out uh, as needed. You know, if you know, if Zika or, or West Nile virus is in the area, uh, but I would think for the most part, you know, we're doing this from a nuisance perspective, and we shouldn't be playing to, to public fears, um, you know, or, or you know, trying to sell a mosquito job um, out of that particular fear. So you know, uh, again, be good stewards. Uh, avoid claims of complete mosquito control. You know, this is about mosquito management, not complete mosquito elimination. Um, and, and also avoid claims of uh, disease prevention. And just keep in mind that this is you know a bigger part of a, a mosquito IPM program. And uh, just make sure that you uh, understand the label that you're using uh, and be aware of your uh, state and local regulations regarding uh, the control of mosquitoes. Great. Well, thanks again. Uh, thanks again, Nikki and Grayson, and uh, thanks, thanks again to everybody who took a little bit of time out of their day to be a part of the webinar. Have a great day, everybody.